Great. Okay, I think we're in. Um, so thanks so much for tuning into this. Um, I am Constantine Leludis, the head of partnerships here at Let's Do This. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Toby Jenkins, um, owner of AAT Events, one of our star race directors um, who we've been working with for a while now. Um, how this session is going to work is uh, I'm going to present on uh, some of the learnings we want to share here from Let's Do This and explain to you guys what we do because uh, we appreciate we're you know, fairly uh, new to the scene here and certainly new uh, to the community. Um, and then Toby and I are going to turn and discuss kind of the, the landscape of events marketing and race directories um, uh, and wrap up with a conversation, uh, drawing a bit on his experience as well as our own. Um, so we're going to start um, by sharing this presentation with you guys. Um, please do uh, comment underneath. Uh, I've got a few screens going on here, so I'm just going to move um, one of them over here so that I can see the comments as they come in. Um, uh, just give me a moment. Okay, we should be back in there now, ready to present. So, we are Let's Do This. Um, and uh, we are a marketplace for endurance sports events. We were founded in London a couple of years ago. We now operate in the UK uh, and in the US, starting in California about a year ago. Um, and uh, the idea of this presentation really is to explain <coughs> what we do, why um, we think uh, this industry is uh, in need of change in some respect, and crucially, the value we think we can add to race directors. And so this is with me, uh, head of partnerships here, and Toby Jenkins, a uh, key client of ours, and a, a big race director here in the UK. Uh, so race directories have been around for a while. Um, they're nothing new. Uh, on the right here, you can see a couple of um, slightly antiquated examples. Uh, and really, when these first arrived in the late 90s, they obviously had a lot of value for athletes. Um, they... Uh, you know, I gave this new search functionality and were a big upgrade on magazine listings that had prevailed to date. But now in 2019, uh, you know, we, you look at them and you think the user interface is a bit clunky, the search is quite difficult, um, there's limited race information available, uh, the listings are often incomplete, you have to click out to purchase, so it's quite a sort of um, uh, kind of broken experience. And really for race directors, the only functionality there is, is listing. Um, there's no kind of sense of outbound marketing. Certainly race directors feel they ought to be listed, but, but it's a, a pretty two-dimensional kind of experience for the race director. You look to other industries, and it's very different, particularly in the field of um, accommodation and restaurants. Aggregators have made the discovery process much easier, and the four obvious ones that come to mind are Airbnb, Booking.com, TripAdvisor, and OpenTable. And to the right, we've got the user interface for Airbnb that will be very familiar to a lot of you guys. By contrast, races um, are still really hard to find. Consumers rely on Google and on word of mouth. Um, there is no you know, uh, user-friendly aggregator for events and with comprehensive listings. Um, and this presents a barrier to entry for, for participants, but it also presents a barrier to growth for race directors and for the whole industry. And so we came into this thinking, actually, if we can build a product that is, is as user-friendly as Airbnb, but in the race space, then um, you know, users are going to benefit from that, and more than anyone, race directors are going to benefit from that. So in a nutshell, this is what we offer participants, is an innovative user interface, uh, sorry, intuitive user interface. Um, you can look at the map view. It bears more than a passing resemblance to the functionality we saw on Airbnb. An easy search, uh, enriched race information. Uh, you know, we, we've listened to participants, we've seen the data, and we know what information part participants really want uh, before they're willing to register. Uh, they can purchase on site, so the experience isn't isn't broken, and we pass that information on to registration providers. Um, and the journey is supported, and we send them content-driven emails based on their experience level to help them get to the start line and across the finish line and registering for their next race. So it's a bit more three-dimensional. Um, it's aiming to get these uh, new racers coming along and then repeating their experience. 
what we offer for race directors. Now, obviously, um, I'm going to focus on this uh, at much greater length. Uh, in a nutshell, it's new participants, incremental revenue, and automated marketing. And I'm going to break that down a bit now. So there are a couple of ways to visualize this. Um, here we've got it visualized in terms of the race director's overall revenue. And so to take this example, in 2018, if a, a race might not work with us, and they've got their pre-existing revenue base uh, in that gray block. 2019, they work with us. Their pre-existing revenue base is unaffected. Uh, now, of course, they might go and do their own uh, marketing campaigns. That might, might be massively successful, which is fantastic. Uh, but I've seen no change here in their other marketing activities. Then the idea is we come in and we add another layer of marketing on top. And in blue, you can see new revenue. And in orange is the commission we take. So the idea is that it's all uh, extra revenue for the race director. And as I said in the bottom, our marketing pays for itself. Uh, you know, it's zero risk for the race director. And then our services don't affect registrations that race directors take through their own marketing. And I've emphasized that because that's a confusion we've come up against a lot of times where race directors turn around and think that we, we wanna that we want to be a registration provider. We absolutely don't. And and you know uh, of course, run sign up very prevalent in this group and other players are doing that um, full time, professionally, doing an awesome job. Uh, we are at an outbound marketing tool that plugs into that. Uh, now, another way to visualize this is on a per registration basis. So, essentially, we deliver participants at a lower cost per acquisition, i.e., marketing spend per, per participant, than alternative sources. The obvious uh, source of outbound marketing to compare ourselves to is Facebook. Um, so uh, here we've got it illustrated, the price of one registration. In green, there you've got the race director's margin. Um, and in blue, uh, you've got the cost per acquisition. Now, compare to working with us uh, on the right uh, with Let's Do This, and the margin is increased, the green part is increased, um, and the cost per acquisition is smaller. So that's at the core, that's our pitch to race directors is, we will bring you new participants for a lower cost per acquisition than you could get on our other outbound channels like Facebook so that you can increase that share that's in green, which is the margin that you take home. Now, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to uh, break this down a little bit. This graph plots uh, registrations um, on the x-axis against cost per acquisition on the y-axis. And the idea here is that as you get more and more registrations, you have to spend more incrementally to bring those registrations in. So looking at the bottom left, initial registrations come for free. Now, of course, they're not actually for free. You've had to stage your event. You've got, you face the big fi fixed costs, but you bear no marginal marketing costs for bringing in those registrations. Um, you know, they may be repeat customers. They may be people coming with friends who've been referred. Whatever it is, you haven't had to go outbound and, and spend extra money on, on Facebook or wherever to bring those in. A little bit further up, pay-per-click um, captures high-intent consumers. So these might be people who were pretty high-intent. They searched for your race, but you've had to pay on Google to capture them and bring them in. A bit further up, um, you've got uh, where we've uh, put ourselves and Facebook, outbound marketing channels. You know, p uh, These services will bring you participants that you wouldn't otherwise have had. And they eat into your margin a little more, so the, the green arrow will be slightly smaller. Um, but they are incremental participants that you wouldn't otherwise have had, so that you're getting your race closer to capacity. Looking further up and to the top right in the red, uh, after a certain point, the cost per acquisition exceeds a race director's gross margin. And so what that means is, in plain English, you're having to spend more on marketing than you're even taking home after considering the fixed costs you bear to put on an event and the marginal cost you face to per participant, you know, the medal, the t-shirt, whatever it may be. So those in the, uh, in the red, it doesn't make sense to carry on there. And so essentially what success really looks like and what we want to help our race directors get to is capturing all those registrations that are to the left of that dotted purple line. Because those are all the registrations where uh, you take home a profit by bringing them in uh, because your cost per acquisition is lower than your gross margin on that ticket. And we've tried to position ourselves in between the pay-per-click stuff and the Facebook stuff, um, uh, a cheaper source than Facebook, but much like Facebook, we bring those incremental uh, participants. So 
the question uh, we oh, thank you, Josh Reed. Glad to hear you can hear me loud and clear. Um, the question we often get asked is, how do you bring new participants? Well, in a nutshell, we target low intent traffic and direct it to our partner races. And this is really key. This, this means we're not cannibalizing existing participants. So low intent traffic, what does that mean? It means people who don't yet know which race they plan to do. So they are searching 10K near me, or that, you know, they, they watch the London Marathon at the weekend and they want to do a marathon, but they don't know which. Um, by targeting these people, we ensure that we bring race directors genuinely new participants and that we really are a value add to them, making their events bigger year on year. So, our channels. Um, I'm going to go through these briefly and then we'll get on to the conversation with Toby. Um, number one, we power race listings on Runners World. Runners World had their own race listings, um, but as the, event, uh, as the industry grew, um, and as they switched focus, uh, they decided it was no longer worth the investment from them to maintain their own database. And so, happily, we've partnered with them to bring their users uh, this race search. It's been live in the US uh, for a little while. It's going live in the UK um, in a week or so. And this, obviously, fantastic source of referral traffic, tra referral traffic from the world's um, most dominant running publication. Secondly, we rank for low intent searches um, on Google and other search engines. Uh, that means 5K NME, 10K California, Half Marathon UK. These kind of searches um, from low intent traffic who don't really, you know, they don't know which event they want to do um, and they're looking for some guidance and we want to put ourselves right there uh, in front of them at their moment of discovery so that we can send them to our partner race directors. Number three is Facebook. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of uh, people listening to this will have tried out my marketing on Facebook. Um, it's obviously uh, pretty challenging and time intensive, apart from um, quite apart from the cost incurred doing it. And targeting Facebook users with individual races is a hard sell. Um, and I, Toby was saying this earlier when we were talking to him about it. You know, trying to target even quite, well uh, quite a well-defined set of Facebook users with an individual event at, an in at a certain time in a certain place, uh, you're pretty lucky if you get them at the right time, even with an advertising product as sophisticated as Facebook. The advantage we have is that by offering a very broad selection of races, we can achieve a higher conversion rate than, than race directors might be able to on their own, and so we can do it more cheaply, and those savings we, passed on, we pass on to race directors in the form of reduced cost for acquisition. And on the right, I've just shown a, a quick example of a carousel ad on Facebook where we would present a whole selection to people based on the data we might have about them or based on the uh, data uh, Facebook makes available to us for targeting, bring them into the site, get them to convert, um, more registrations for race directors. Uh, fourth, um, nothing too innovative here, email. Um, we have a large and growing mailing list. Uh, the only thing to mention is we have a lot of data on our users and we know their search history and we can use that to target them with relevant race recommendations via email. Uh, email is not dead. I've heard enough people saying that it is. We're certainly not finding that it is here um, and it's a pretty good uh, ROI channel. Uh, fifth, now this is a bit different, but actually I think it's more interesting and more important than, than all of the others really. Um, in the black box we've got registrations uh, is equals traffic times conversion rate. That's to say, the number of registrations we bring race directors um, is a function of the volume of traffic we bring on site and the rate at which they convert to registration. We've got a lot of traffic passing through the site, which enables us to optimize each stage of that funnel to boost conversion rate. And 4.6% of all site visitors are actually completing a registration. So looking to the, left half of the, uh, the right half of this slide, um, uh, you can see the funnel, at the top of the funnel homepage, the journey moves to search results and race page, and crucially to registration. And different traffic sources will come into that funnel at different stages. Uh, so you've got retained users and direct traffic at the top, um, probably most of our traffic coming into the next stage with uh, you know, our runners world and other widgets elsewhere on the internet, um, uh, Facebook marketing, and those generic search terms we talked about. 5K near me, um, uh, you know, 10K New York, that kind of thing. And then our own emails uh, directing people straight to the race page. And then on the right, uh, you've got the conversion rate from one stage to the next, 
which multiplied together give us about 4.6% total conversion. And the advantage here is just that by having so many um, users coming through the site, we achieve that real kind of statistical significance in the data. And uh, you know, obviously with a dedicated development team um, and a customer out outreach team, we can understand what information uh, users want to see to give them the confidence to get over the line. Um, and by doing so, can boost conversion for our race directors and bring them more registrations. Now, this is only going to be a quick, um, I'm just going to kind of wet appetites quickly for what a session we might do in the future, but data-driven marketing. So we know which races our users want to do, and we know that because we have a lot of data about them. We know their age, gender, location, distance preferences, and experience level. And we put our users through an onboarding flow, which you can see on the right. Um, we use that data to offer users great race recommendations and keep them coming back to us to find new races. Uh, and so essentially, you know, it's, it's, it's a cliche now, but the more data we have on these people, the better and more relevant and more tailored the content we can serve to them and the higher conversion will be. And we know uh, when they want to do these races. Uh, so here we've just got three different disciplines, 10K, half marathon and triathlon. Pretty important to know this stuff. There's no point, for example, targeting, uh, to take an extreme example, targeting a 10K, a potential 10K race goer eight months before the race. Uh, and we look here and we see that 50% of 10K registrations take place in the final six weeks. 50% of half marathon registrations in the final 12 weeks and the same for triathlon in the final 14 weeks. So each of those um, disciplines requires a different schedule of marketing. Um, and that's something we're very mindful of, along with targeting the right people, you've got to target them at the right time. And that's something which, uh, which we've, we've worked out pretty well, but we're still learning. Uh, and so one or two things we'll discuss in another session, registration windows, really digging in a bit more on uh, what I just said. Um, the impact of race page information on conversion rate, we think this is really interesting to race directors because it's something you can action on your own websites. Um, what's the key information that participants want to know before they convert? Uh, you know, is it start time? Is it um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, what the weather will be on race day? There are all sorts of things, you know, you can import widgets for that sort of thing. There are all sorts of things which you might not think to serve up to participants that actually they really want to know. Um, uh, there's the impact of reviews on conversion rate is an interesting one, kind of user-generated content. And then there's a uh, number of page views before conversion. It, some users will view a, page, view a page five times before actually converting. Uh, it varies by the profile of different events, and that's the sort of thing which can inform your own marketing when thinking about retargeting uh, registrants. So, thanks so much for watching. Um, it's wonderful to be part of the community, and we certainly feel like we're really only getting started on this journey. So, I hope that what we've given you here is useful and actionable for you and interesting, but we most certainly are looking forward to learning, learning from all of you guys. Um, and with that, we're going to... Uh, switch cameras and get Toby involved again. So, um, Toby, first of all, I'm a little bit stiff because I ran your uh, half marathon the weekend. and it run, run or jog? Constantly. Yeah, it was more of a jog. It wasn't a PB. I mean, it was about, no, I'm not actually going to say what the time was because I'm embarrassed. Uh, but my colleague did the ultra, um, so he thoroughly embarrassed me. But you were very sporting about it. Um, so, uh, first question for you. You've been directing races 15 years. What's your experience, what, when you started, was your experience of race directory websites, maybe 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, 15 years ago this, this year, actually, um, exactly, we were celebrating 15 years of organising events. And uh, 15 years ago, we just had a jolly good idea to organise a running race. And there's only one website, it was Runners World, and we put a listing up there, it's free. And uh, 200 people sent us their checks, their little £10 checks, on the kitchen table, a big pile of checks. Amazing. I mean, it's going to hand them into the bank and they charge us a fee for processing each check. But the, the power of it was amazing because there was only one website and it was, mm -hmm. could have been improved. Yeah. Yeah. And here we are and then uh, other listing websites came on um, and that was trial and error. Mm -hmm. And then this whole thing called SEO mm -hmm. develops and no one really mastered it, have they? The dark mm -hmm. art. It's something we spend a lot of time thinking about with those, like I said, sort of those 5K and me type searches. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to work on because you don't get that feedback as to, to when it's working and improving. 
but yeah, it's, it's certainly something that you know individual race directors can think about as well. But I think that's really interesting with Run as well. So they were initially the only listing site, and not only that, but people were sending you checks. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I mean, if I bring that to bear on, let's do this. I think you know that's that's certainly not the foundation we're starting from, but it's not so different. You know, if you look at um, uh, some of the stuff uh, being served up on Run Britain, for example, or um, Maybe it's a little unfair to say this, but running in the USA is not so dissimilar, where it's quite two-dimensional. They've really added value in the early days, but um, it, it's not that kind of supported journey that we're trying to go for here. Um, and so, uh, next question for you. What did you... I remember picking up the phone to you back in about uh, January 2018. What was your first thought when uh, you heard about us and you got our pitch? Because I think we were doing something a little bit different with this whole idea of bringing incremental, incremental registrations. What, what first crossed your mind when we brought that proposal to you? How can I get the salesman off the phone? <laughs> I, can get, I can get rid of this guy. Um, well, you've done a good job of that. <laughs> be persevered. And I, my eyes, ro eyes rolled because at that time there were a bunch of other race listing websites. Actually, there were so many. Everyone seemed to want to list events. And you guys were proposing that you were going to actually take registrations for us. Mm, mm. And, um, and I had this whole thing with you about why should we do that? We're going to lose a marketing budget. And then I thought, well, I'm going to save some of my marketing budget and just let you sort it out. Yeah, yeah. And we, we tentatively went ahead okay. and we did it. And some people entered one of our races. Amazing. I, mean, I remember, you know, in the early days when we were just getting started and when those first few people started coming, it was a pretty exciting time. And I certainly remember you, you came on pretty early in the scheme of things. So it's, it's nice to have you on that journey with us. <laughs> we, we, we had this awkward thing about doing the Fox Ultra a couple of years ago and people turned up to our event and said, oh, I'm here for, to run the Fox Ultra. And uh, I was going, well, you're not on my start list. And it was the proof of the pudding that actually Let's Do This had sold entries yeah. on our behalf. I mean, we haven't quite got our yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, Well, it was early days. I mean, we had we had a few of those teething problems back then, I remember. But you're right. In a way, it's not the way we wanted to happen, but it certainly proved that those yeah. incremental participants were... Right away. And this what? guy was standing there with a Let's Do This t-shirt. So he bought a Let's Do This t-shirt, and he was standing there saying, I was going, who is this guy? <laughs> there's more than one. Okay, well, uh, we wear, we wear like, AAC events t-shirts in the office, so yeah, yeah, we're, we're all even there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to... <laughs> actually, first of all, I'm going to look at... There's a question here... Um, is there a setup cost for races to join your service? Um, or can any race, however small, try it out? Uh, the answer is there's no fixed cost. Um, we've, you know, to enter this market, we knew in many ways we'd be doing something slightly different. And so we didn't want to approach races and say, there's this big setup cost. You, you're taking on a lot of risk. Um, you know, we wanted to always tie what we get paid to the value we bring race directors. So no, there's no cost. And really, no race uh, is too small. And, and, you know, even in some instances, I think often small races can benefit uh, in particular, although actually we'll, we'll probably, it's quite a long conversation now, so we'll probably leave the kind of ideal, our ideal race profile to another session. But short answer, no fixed cost. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, new participants and the potential for cannibalization, because this is obviously something which... Um, uh, we're very hot on, um, we're not adding value for bringing people repeat participants. When you started coming on with us, did you find that we were bringing you genuinely new participants? Uh, uh, and what percentage of the people we were bringing had, had you had any record of in your database? Yeah, I was very anxious about that. And um, we started analysing the entrants that were coming in. And we could tell from our existing customers that there were new customers. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of crossovers. Um, I can't remember the stats. I, it literally was 20 or 30 people you got on board and we had one or two mm -hmm. were existing customers. Mm -hmm. I thought, dang, I'm going to waste my commission on you guys. <laughs> but um, in reality, you're, you're basically another arm of our marketing mm -hmm. and you're bringing people from the London area, which is local to us, which is great. You're finding people outside our normal cash return. Mm -hmm. And for the, okay, so I, I, I invest a bit of money back on you guys, but you take a whole heap of uh, effort off us. Yeah. Okay. It works. Um, two things I want to pick up on there. Firstly, and I remember you made the suggestion a while ago, why not have kind of tiered rates for, you know, depending on how far away from your race the participants are. And we think that's a really interesting idea. If, for example, you know, you, you, um, uh, you run a race in, in Dallas, let's say, you know, uh, we could charge a certain amount, uh, a reduced amount for people coming from Dallas, 
And then if they are more than 50K away, then the commission goes up a little bit because that's the point at which we are bringing generally incremental participants. So it's something you suggested. We still haven't built it out. The product roadmap is long and varied um, and crowded, uh, but it's definitely something we want to do. Um, uh, the other thing you mentioned, um, uh, I forget now, so <laughs> I'm actually just going to address this question. Um, right, so we've got Oliver Arnott asking, Toby, how easy was it to get set up with LDT? Um, Shall I answer that one? Yeah, go for it. I think, that, can, well, actually, I'll, I'll have my caveat afterwards. Do you, you give me the answer? <laughs> no, 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 you go for it. Don't let me go for Honestly, it's really easy. Um, so, I almost don't know how it happened. You guys phoned me up and you scraped some information off our website already and pre set it up. And I think you guys gave me a call, I reviewed it, and just pressed the button and go. So let's do this. Actually, took a lot of the, the uh, work okay. off our hands and just cre created the page, created the content, mm -hmm. and I reviewed it, and there we were. Very awesome. easy. Okay, good stuff. Very glad to hear that. We certainly tried to make it as easy as possible for race directors because we know uh, from hard experience, our CEO, before setting up this company, was a race director himself. Um, how uh, you know how, how uh, busy the race directors are, whether they're full time or part time. It's you know, and this sort of thing, while super important, is not something you want to have to spend all your time thinking about. Which actually ties into the other thing uh, I wanted to talk about, which was how much work you know you've tried. I know you've tried some Facebook advertising. Have you found that's been not only a financial drain but a time drain for you? Yeah, a bit of both, and of course it is a dark art, so you can never really find out whether mm. it's worked or not. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to try all the marketing channels and we try a bit of Facebook and we get some uh, advice on how to do that and we guys are working with you guys and you just got to try everything and you've got to have your fingers in all the pies and try all the channels mm -hmm. and it's not been a negative experience with yeah. Let's Do This and um, we do get some traffic still from Facebook mm -hmm. and I think Matt Trevor on the old forum there is asking pretty much the same question if Matt had listened to the previous, <laughs> previous uh, presentation uh, mm -hmm. Keener, he'd know the answer. Um, you've got to do a bit of both, but I think um, they work hand in hand. You know, Facebook advertising ourselves is time consuming and almost difficult to really understand. It's working mm. or not. Mm. Equally, uh, advertising through you guys is okay. Yeah, I mean, and this is something I think we hadn't even realized how, you know, how much time race directors were spending on this stuff, maybe not seeing ROI. And so we think, you know, we tend to think if we can bring a lot of race directors sort of under one marketing umbrella a little bit and, and, uh, you know, we do that hard work and then share the benefits with a lot of race directors. It's just got to be better for everyone. And ultimately, we'll probably all end up spending fewer dollars and pounds on Facebook, uh, which will be good for our whole industry, I think, for a fixed ROI and, and, and for a certain number of incremental participants. Um, so, uh, Matt Trevor, yeah. Um, can Let's Do This fit in with uh, organizers' own Facebook and Google marketing? Uh, I mean, yes, essentially. I think, you know, the one thing we don't do on Facebook um, is out, uh, do outbound marketing for individual events. Now, you probably have more data, well, you definitely have more data on your own past participants. You might want to be retargeting them. Uh, you might want to be um, retargeting them uh, not only based on their identity as past participants, but also people who've landed on your website, um, retargeting them if they've abandoned their checkout or something like that. So that's something you can do that, that we can't do because that's your data, not ours. Um, and certainly uh, Google marketing, um, yeah, you know, I, I think, um, you know, defending search terms, that sort of thing. In due course, as we grow this out, um, you know, we, we want to add more and more value. And, and if it gets to the stage where race director is saying, look, I'm achieving, you know, if we recall that uh, graph, I'm on that purple line, I'm getting all the registrations I could be that are actually adding net margin to me then maybe race directors don't need to do this stuff. But we take absolutely no objection to you know, race directors doing all that stuff themselves. Uh, we're just conscious that it takes a lot of time, and if not done right, it can be uh, a financial drain as well, which is why we, uh, you know, we're here to do it for them and hopefully do it more cheaply and more effectively Constant. as well. Constant. What I want to do is I want to organise running races. You saw my rambling a bit. No, no I, 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 the things I want to organise running races, and I don't want to spend my time fiddling in the dark arts of well, Facebook, because no one understands it. I mean, to tell you the God and it's true, there are times when I think all I want to do is run races, as in actually yeah. participate in them. And not, but, but uh, no, I tell you what you mean. I, you know, I, 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 this stuff, it can be an absolute, um, uh, you know, it, it can get to your, your mind. And it's, it's pretty, certainly the SEO side you mentioned, 
Google are so opaque about how that works. You know, we, with uh, a fair few developers, um, a whole product team, often, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot we don't understand. There are bigger tech companies than us who, who don't understand this stuff. And so, you know, in many ways, for, for the, the single race director or for a, you know, a, a, race directing, uh, a race management company that employs maybe even 20 people, it's, it's quite a tall ask to get your head around this stuff when it's almost designed to be opaque in the case of SEO. Um, and it requires ever more technical wizardry as more and more people are entering, entering this market, trying to kind of arbitrage this advertising, all are going after the same participants in what, as Run Sign Up have said repeatedly, is actually quite a flat market. And so competition for these participants' eyeballs is pretty intense. Um, Someone on Race Director had a good question there. Can you, can you scroll oh, down? let's scroll down. Give us, just bear with us a moment. All the technology. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just below the... Uh, so, was that, how does the money wiring work? Um, uh, yeah, so... Um, so, the money wiring. So, we use Stripe to process payments, which I think are generally recognised as now the leaders in online payment processing. Uh, the money arrives uh, in uh, race directors' uh, Stripe accounts, uh, net of fees, and we cover the Stripe fees. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's essentially it. Get, setting up a Stripe account is super easy. It takes, um, I mean, you did it before, it takes about five or ten minutes. Um, and we're, you know, we're certainly at the end of a phone if that's any issue. Um, as, you know, Stripe is becoming, I think they call themselves the global standard in online payments. So they're, they're pretty good, very secure, very easy to get set up. Um, and we've got a question from Holly Light. Um, yeah, so um, does uh, race participant data go straight to the race director's online registration platform? The answer is, in some cases, yes. We're building out registrations with uh, registration platforms. Um, we've done it with EventTrack in the UK. Um, we are in the process of doing it with uh, Run Sign Up uh, in the US, who have been fantastic to work with and you know, with whom we certainly share a belief in open technology. Um, it's something, uh, you know, it's really something where you, if we had more developers, we'd be, we'd be doing it for all the platforms right now. Um, so, and, and in other cases, um, it, it works slightly differently, slightly more ad hoc, but really the longer term view is integrate with those registration platforms so that for the race director, it just arrives in their registration platform, it's there, and they can also see that it's tagged as having been a let's do this registration. Clever. Mm. Clever, yeah, exactly. I don't do that sort of stuff, I just do the talking. Um, uh, do you know what, I think, um, I think we're nearly there. Did you have anything else you wanted to... No, add? no. Thanks for the coffee earlier. Good stuff. That wasn't... I didn't buy you that. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't sanction that. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, I do want to ask you a bit more. Um, what... Uh, do you... Just to close off, even though this is opening up a big topic, do you find that it's um, the market... The whole market has become more competitive and tougher and that you've had to adapt your events to a changing market? You forget, let's do this. Yeah, um, there are so many events in the UK, it's crazy. Um, there are a number of events every weekend all across the UK, but there are not so many good events, mm -hmm. and it's trying to find the good events and the high quality events. And you can always find a cheeky 10K, it's got a star and a finish uh, and a medal, but to find nice quality ones where you cross mm -hmm. the line and all the logistics work yeah. and the information's worked and um, you know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's difficult. You touched on it there. What makes a, a good event? Is it just a case of running smoothly or is there a certain kind of something that separates a really uh, great event from a run of the middle event? Well, you've got to enter an AAT events event. Well, yeah, my absolutely, events. AAT. So, go over that. <laughs> uh, just out of London, UK. Um, but then, uh, no, you're looking out for nice things like uh, the race starts on time and the information is as it should be mm. and the course is measured accurately. Mm. And then there are nice volunteers out there and they've got to have some nice food. Mm. And when you finish line uh, across the line, you should get a really good quality bespoke medal mm. and the results should be live immediately. Yeah. Um, this is something we're um, hot on. It, I, it's something, you know, when we look at this industry and we see, we kind of, have analysed, uh, you know, most aspects of the tech offering in this industry. We think results is something. I completely agree with what you just said. Why are your results not available as soon as you cross the line? Now I know when I cross the line, whether it was 
quite slow like it was last weekend, or if I've you know, really gone out there for a PB, I want to know what they are straight away. And it's can't, you know, I don't believe it can be that difficult to deliver it straight away. It's not difficult, and you get the right suppliers, you mm -hmm. can do that. I mean, yeah. We do that at all our events. Um, but it's, uh, there are good quality events and some events that just need to be improved um, and hopefully they'll come out of the wash. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, and again, this is echoing some of the stuff uh, Run Sign Up have said and, you know, the really interesting take on this with the uh, Race Trends report. But actually, uh, the flattening market will probably, will be much worse for average and poor events than it will for, you know, events like yours. It will probably force a correction in the industry where some people who came in thinking how hard can it be will, will probably learn the hard way that actually it's not that easy. I enjoy, I always sit back after an event and think, do you know what, five, six hundred people, whatever it might be, have just invested mm. uh, a bunch of money in my event. They've gone and parted whatever, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, and they want to have a good event. They don't want to be worrying about the logistics, mm. they want to be seamless. They mm. almost want to mm. just know that it's been good value. Yeah. And uh, I don't want my customers going with bad taste in their mouth. Mm. Gosh, that wasn't regular value. Um, like you do when you go to the cinema and you get fleeced. You want to go to a great event and come away and go, yeah, cool medal. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how badly they did, and even if they had to the pull out halfway through with injury, it doesn't matter as long as they were put up, um, picked up and looked after. Absolutely. Um, and, and now, that definitely is the last question. Um, it seems like a lot of race directors are very wary of, particularly in the UK, I have to say, I don't think this is the case so much in the US where registration prices are higher. Um, Race race in the UK are very wary of raising prices past a certain point and of testing that elasticity of demand. Um, I've always slightly thought, though I don't have the evidence to back this up because we don't set registration prices, that race directors could be a little bit more bullish. And you know, rather than charging um, twenty pounds for a half marathon, they could be they could be trying to charge forty. Um, because actually people see that investment both you know, more in terms of their time and in terms of the training effort rather than the cost to actually enter on the day. And for a lot of people, you know, for, for a lot of these participants, entering a half marathon is a huge deal. It's a six month training affair. And so actually parting with 40 pounds, not such a big deal. What's your take on that? Do you think I'm wrong? Or, or are you just not as commercially hard nosed as me and you think I don't want to fleece my participants? Well, I think we are actually, for our company, charging uh, quite top end for the prices. Mm. But we're coming out of this old, whole era of the 1980s and people running around in plimsolls and uh, from club, club runners. Uh, there's this legacy of uh, people paying one pound or two pound for running <coughs> race. So <laughs> we're stretching it already. Yeah. Uh, whereas maybe in the States they just went straight to putting on good commercial yeah. events. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, uh, I think that we're targeting a different demographic. Okay. It's the ABC ones and it's the guys who've got, are doing living in the big cities, they yeah. want to just spend some money, come yeah. out to the country, run at a really good event. And uh, yeah, they can afford it, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. We need to push the prices. Toby, I think with that, um, we'll leave them behind. Uh, and next time, Holly, I will be entering the Ultra, don't you worry. Um, so that, just on that, there's always a delay in publishing results, because it's dependent on how slow the run gets across the line. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so under I'm, understood. I get, okay, okay. I get you can't tell me my time before I've crossed yeah. the line. Yeah, nice. All right, okay. <laughs> I know I was slow. I know I was slow. Um, but we're not all, we can't all be super quick. Um, Toby, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I hope this is good. It's the first time we've done this, so let's do this. Uh, we're still learning. Um, we barely even dug into the kind of data and insights we've got available, but I hope that gives you an idea of uh, what we can do, uh, who we are, um, uh, we'll be over in the US. We have an office in the US as well, so we'll be broadcasting from there as well. Um, and please do reach out with any questions. Um, I'll put it in the in the notes, but my email is constantine at let's do this dot com. Um, I'd be delighted to speak to you. Um, and happy Tuesday! Thanks very much. Bye bye.